call this message this morning, He is worthy of thanks. He is worthy of thanks. Um, if you've been in this church for any amount of time, you'll probably realize that I'm not a brilliant topical speaker or a seasonal preacher. What I mean is I don't preach Mother's Day sermons on Mother's Day, and I don't tend to preach Easter sermons on Easter. And the reason is I, and I don't like the calendar dictating to me what I preach. Does that make sense? You know, either God speaks and then I bring His heart, or else I get the calendar and say, what am I going to preach in three weeks' time? But at this time of the year, um, I know that God has led this message of thanksgiving on my heart. So I'm not preaching it because it's thanksgiving, but there's a reason that God wants me to share it this morning. Um, I am convinced that the genuine... But th genuine thanksgiving comes from a sincere and a grateful heart. It comes from a true revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It causes us to appreciate the Lord, who He is, and what He has done for us. And when we give thanks to the Lord, we are giving the Lord what He deserves. He deserves thanks. And um, Psalm 116, 17 says, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and will call upon the name of of the Lord. Thanksgiving is far more than just one special day of the year for the Christian. God expects us to live a life of thanksgiving every single day. Amen. Amen. And I, I just want to ask you this morning, before I get into this message, is every day a thanksgiving day to you? Yes. Because that's what it should be for us. Um, and that's what God was impressing upon me this morning. I do appreciate um, Thanksgiving in America because I didn't know what Thanksgiving was when I lived in Ireland. We don't have a Thanksgiving. And um, praise the Lord that, that there is a day where our nation, whether they get carried away with other things or whatever, thank God there is still a day. And it is a day to give thanks to God. Not to the government, not to the politicians, not to the businessmen. It's a, it's a day to give thanks to our God. And praise God, it's still there. And uh, I'm not trying to underestimate that this morning. But we have a lot of ignorance today in Christian circles in regard to the character of God, which has sadly produced a bogus Christianity. This has caused people to be very mechanical in their spirituality and has resulted in many just playing church. And I'm just saying that the day we live in, it kind of grieves me that people don't give thanks out of a thankful heart. Um, you see, a selfish, carnal Christianity doesn't require any change. It doesn't require a cost. But also, there's no appreciation whenever you're just going through the motions. Please know this, that you have not been birthed of the Spirit of God just to please yourself. You've been birthed of God to please Him. And when you give thanks, you are giving God what you were created to do. Many are around Christians long enough to know the lingo. They know what to do. And sometimes we can get into a ritual. Um, if you get around Christians long enough, you know when to say amen. You know when to say hallelujah. You know when to stand up, sit down. You know, even it's possible even to know how to do a praise report. But the whole key about being a genuine Christian is to have true intimacy with your God. And to, to know his character. If you don't know his character, you will never be thankful. You have to know who our God is. Uh, spiritual things can even become mechanical for the genuine Christian. If they don't stay close to God and keep <coughs> things fresh. You can attend church. You may raise your hand. You may even speak in tongues. But that does not mean that you're intimate with God. Or that you have an understanding of his character. What I want to say this morning is, the key for us giving thanks is getting close to Him and actually knowing who He is. Amen. We need to know who He is because anything that is of God is a res that we do is a response to God. It's a response to our God. Um, the sign that a Christian is close to God is that they start to act like Him <coughs> and they start to become increasingly <coughs> grateful for everything that He has done and everything that He provides. How could you encounter the grace, the love, and the mercy of God and not be thankful? 
I mean, let's be honest this morning. I, you know, we should be thankful every day for what He has done for us, what He is doing for us, and what He is going to do for us. And that is the incredible thing about being a genuine Christian. The longer you walk with Christ, you cultivate a closer relationship with Him. You prove His faithfulness more and more. And you also see the depth of care He has for His children. You learn that He is indeed gracious, merciful, and loving, as the Bible says, despite your faults and despite mine. What I'm saying is that all of us have fallen short. Every single person in this house, even in this past week, have fallen short of what He requires. But He still loves us. Amen. And I'm just saying that there is reason this morning for us to give thanks. And I, I do believe this, that the longer you walk with God, the more thankful you should become. Amen. If you're real. If you genuinely are a, a true believer, the longer you walk with Him, the more you've proved Him. You've proved His character. You've proved that God is who He says He is. And what I'm saying is, it, it's... If you've just got religion in your head, this whole thing will just be a ritual. Well, I come to church because I had to come to church. Or I came to church because I didn't want to have any bad luck this week. You know, some people feel like that. You know, I'm not saying anyone who comes here, but I've talked to people, well, if I didn't go to church, I would be scared I would have bad luck. Well, that's not real. Do you understand? And I'm saying we have something real this morning. We do have a God that's real, and therefore, when He starts to manifest His character, we do become thankful because He's everything that we aren't. This walk with God creates something deep within us. An inherent appreciation for the character of God is called a thankful heart. You become a walking evidence that our God is real. Have you proved Him? Have you proved God that He's real? <clears throat> um... I can tell you, if you're walking with Him a while, you will prove Him. Psalm 100, verse 4, the passage we read this morning says, and listen to this, Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. <coughs> Be thankful unto Him, and bless His name. Why? For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Can you see how thanks results from a revelation of his character? The psalmist had a revelation of who his God was. And if you have a revelation of who your God is, what results is thanks. Because our God is a good God. I was just thinking that if the psalmist was in this church and we left it open for <laughs> praise reports or whatever, this would be his three reasons to get up, and just say, he would say, my God, this is his three reasons, if I can uh, get them. His Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth for all generations. Um, everything of any eternal worth is a response to God. What I'm saying is, your love for God didn't emanate from you, it came as a response to him. <coughs> love is a response to God. When you are truly walking with Him and talking with Him, it's heaven on earth. Amen? Amen. I, I'm just saying we need to get back to the fact that this is an intimacy. This is a relationship with God. When you start to deviate away from God, it's the closest thing to hell you will experience. <clears throat> Do you realize for us believers that this is our hell? You are going through your hell right now. This is as dark as black, as lonely, as difficult as it's ever going to be. Because soon and very soon, you're going to be with Him forever. But for those that don't know God, this is their heaven. Because what awaits them when they die? And what I'm trying to say is, sometimes we want, we want this earth to be perfect. But I can tell you what, that in the trial... In the darkness, we can still know heaven and earth. Amen. Even whatever you're going through this morning, I don't know what you're going through. You know, as our faces different through our circumstances and our trials, but whatever you're going through this morning, this is as tough as it gets. This is as dark as it gets. This is as difficult. If you remember that God is light, when you start to take a wrong turn, and sometimes God just backs off, 
And people wonder, well, I can't feel God. Well, if you, I'm telling you what, when, you, when God just takes one step back, you feel a darkness. And I, I, I know that you feel the same way as I do. Whenever you feel that darkness, you are desperate to get back close to Him. A genuine Christian is not happy in sin. Amen? Amen. How do you feel whenever you sin? And I, I'm just saying that there's, there's a guilt, there's a shame, there's a darkness that comes with sin. And the, what I'm saying is that for the genuine believer, they are not content unless they're close to God and giving Him thanks. Because that's what you and I were created for. Um, the most miserable person on this earth to be around is a backslider. Do you know that? Do you know why? Because whenever they're in church, they feel miserable. Whenever they're out in the bar, they feel miserable. I'm telling you, I challenge you, any backslider that you know that their profession in any way was real, when they start to wander out into that world, they are miserable. I guarantee you they're not thankful people because they're being selfish. And what I'm saying is because they go into the bar and they're convicted because they know that that's not what they're meant to be doing. They come into church and they're convicted because their whole life is exposed. What I'm saying is when you get born again in the Spirit of God, everything changes. Everything changes. You then, the only place that you're uh, happy at is that place where you're being thankful unto the Lord. Could I encourage you, if your faith seems to have dried up and you're going through the motions, take a moment to consider, what is this all about? What is the Christian life all about? It's all about a relationship. How are you in Him this morning? How are you in the Lord this morning? Can you answer that? <coughs> How are you in God? How are you in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because when all said and done, that's what matters this morning. And um, I want to dig a little bit deeper. And I just want to say this before we go any further. The closer you get to Him, the greater revelation that you get of Him. The greater revelation you get of Him, the more you marvel at His goodness. The more you marvel at His goodness, the more you want to thank Him and worship Him. Amen? Amen. I'm going to say that once more. The closer you get to Him, the greater revelation that you get of Him. The greater a revelation you get of Him, the more you marvel at His goodness. And the more you marvel at His goodness, the more you want to thank and worship Him. So if you're struggling this morning at worshiping Him, just get close to Him. They that draw nigh to me, then He's going to get draw nigh to them. Psalm 95 2 says, Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. Psalm 147 7 says, Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Well, preacher, you don't know what I'm going through this morning. I don't feel like thanking the Lord this morning. So you only thank Him on the mountaintop? You only thank God on the mountaintop? That's not fair. That is why you're up and down in your Christian walk. The worst things that confront us in life are this. Bereavement, sickness, betrayals, loneliness, persecutions, etc., etc. Would you agree? These things are hard to deal with. They are the toughest things. But I have seen Christians go through the, the toughest of trials, the darkest of trials, and they just kept thanking them. And I'm going to say that that's what God is looking from us. And I believe that this is the key to spiritual victory in our day. Whatever Satan, life, and people throw against you, you keep going and you keep giving God what He deserves. If you would only thank Him in the trials, you would appreciate His love even more. Um, you will learn a lot about the depth, the depth of revelation that you have of God and the closeness of your personal relationship whenever you're in a dark and a difficult place. I'm telling you, when things look grim, when things look dark, you'll learn a lot about yourself. You'll learn the depth of revelation you have of God and the closeness of your personal relationship with Him. It is easy to be a Christian when things are going good. 
But the rubber meets the road when it comes to how you deal with the dark trials. Will you keep trusting him? Will you keep thanking him? Will you keep serving him? Or will you go to bed? Psalm 136, 1 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endureth forever. Ephesians 5, 20, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, others will learn a lot about you when you're in the trial. People watch you. When you're going through a trial, your unsafe friends, your unsafe family will look how you deal with the trial. Do you deal with it good? Do you deal with it bad? They want to see something in you that they don't have. See, when the ungodly are going through a tough time, they complain, they get depressed, um, they run to the doctor, or they run for alcohol. That's how people deal with, with tough times. But you and me are different. We run to our God. And by the way, we've got the best pill you ever need, the gospel. Amen. I'm serious. This thing works. If you live in this, I'll tell you, I, I've been in, in the Old Testament, um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I'm telling you, it's tough going there. I don't know why you, you spent much time in there. It's all about the old ceremonial law in the Old Testament. And it, whenever I'm looking for something, I'm learning about burnt offerings and sin offerings and all in the temple. It's tough going there. But I've just kept going because I'm de determined to keep reading from Genesis to Revelation. Genesis to Revelation. Genesis to Revelation until he comes. But what I'm saying is, there's times you just keep going. Keep trusting on him. Keep thanking on your God. A Christian, as they grow in God, tend to get closer to Him during the trials. And this is what brings them through it, that they know their God. That is why sometimes people will ask you a question. Why are you not in a funny form? Or why are you not six foot under? They watch the Christian. They see what they endure. They see that they don't give up. And sometimes they'll come to me and say, why do you keep going? How have you come through all this stuff that you've come through? Do you realize that you've come through that and you are now a walking testimony that your God's alive? Amen. And you can say, I thank the Lord. He held on to me. I thank the Lord. He never gave up on me. And others, if, if they're in the right mind, they say, I want what you have. And sometimes we say, well, why do I have to go through these times? Well, you have to go through them because you're proving to yourself and to others just how real your God is. We have to realize this thing is real, and we have to go through it. Queen Esther testified in Esther 4.16 when she was facing the, the probability of death for standing for righteousness. If I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. What an incredible boldness from this woman of God. The enemy cannot deal with such faith and such trust. What about Job? Job in a very tough place said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. How do you deal? How does the devil deal with a person like that? That even when they're faced with, with absolute darkness and trial and the, the possibility of death, they just keep trusting their God. When Paul was advised by his fellow disciples that he shouldn't go up to Jerusalem or else he would be thrown in prison and then he would be killed. This is what he said in Acts 21.13 For I am ready now to be bound, not only bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm willing to give it all for him because he gave it all for me. Many Christians are governed by circumstances and people. When circumstances are dark, they are dark. When circumstances are bright, they are bright. Many just spend their life on a roller coaster. If you're governed by circumstances, and you're up when things are up, and you're down when things are down, guess what devil, the devil will bring across your path continually? If he knows that you're governed by the circumstances, then guess what? He's going to bring a lot of down circumstances to keep you down. 
The devil, sometimes we think the devil's stupid. He knows you better than you even know yourself. He's not stupid. And sadly, it often takes dark trials in order for us to throw ourselves fully upon the Lord. But a major positive about going through a dark trial is you appreciate the presence of God even more. I'm just saying that even in the trial, there's major positives. And you need to look for that, that positive in the midst of what you're going through this morning. And I believe this subject of thankfulness um, is important and it's at the root of who you are and what you do. In fact, the opposite to thankfulness is murmuring. And each of us this morning will be split into one of two camps. We're either thankful people or we're complainers. Which camp do you belong to? Are you a thankful person? Or are you a complainer? And I want to dig deeper so that you and I will have a better understanding um, to who we are. Because your attitude will determine who you are and what you do. Basically, this matter that we're looking at has a domino effect on everything that you're going to achieve. Thanksgiving affects so many other aspects of our Christian walk that we cannot underestimate the importance of this subject. And if you're taking notes, you might want to write this here down. Thankfulness attracts the presence of God. The presence of God produces the peace of God. The peace of God produces the anointing of God. The anointing of God produces the power of God. And the power of God produces spiritual fruit. Now I'm going to say that again, because Curtis isn't able to write that down as quick as he wanted to. And honestly, I do believe this is from the Holy Ghost. So if you are right, then please write this down. Because a lot of people struggle. Why do I not bear fruit? Or why have I got no power or no peace? The, it, the answer is here. Thankfulness attracts the presence of God. The presence of God produces the peace of God. The peace of God produces the anointing of God. The anointing of God produces the power of God. And the power of God produces spiritual fruit. Can you see the importance of thankfulness? Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and suppl supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. But you must make your prayers with thanksgiving. If you leave thanksgiving out of the equation, your prayers are just a shopping list. All you're saying is, God, give me this, 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 and this. But it says to do it with thanksgiving. That's the key. And I'm telling you, when you, when you have an attitude of thanksgiving, you will attract the presence of God. You'll not be pushing Him away. And the ground that thanksgiving grows in is humility, love, and a true revelation of your God. You know, thankfulness is just not some ritualistic prayer. It's not some prayer that grandma taught you to pray and you just, you, you just go through the motions. Thanksgiving comes from this heart. Thanksgiving comes because you know your God and you have proved Him that He is faithful. And if He is faithful, then He is worthy of thanks. A Christian shouldn't be a complainer. Amen? That's the opposite to being full of thanks. Murmuring, on the other hand, pushes God away. That is why those with a critical spirit struggle to feel the presence of God. They're not good worshippers. They are good at asking God for things, but slow to thank Him or give Him all the glory because they're tied up with themselves. When you push God away, you lose your peace. If you lose your peace, you're not at rest. If you aren't at rest, then you can't carry the anointing. If you can't carry the anointing of God, you lack the power of God. If you lack the power of God, then you fail to produce spiritual fruit. Can you see the opposite? Thanksgiving releases God to do whatever He wants to do. Murmuring or complaining causes God to step back. 
So you, we cannot underestimate this subject that we're looking at this morning. You know, I'm saying all this to help you this morning because, like yourself, I struggle with this subject. I am, you know, there's always a natural man in there that wants to complain, wants to murmur. That's a warfare that you and me will always battle with because your flesh stinks. You're, when you're in the flesh, you will complain. When you're in the spirit, you will be thankful for your God. Can you see the difference? And I can tell you that this is, God yesterday was just dealing with me so much on this subject of thanksgiving. The default system on the computer is messed up. The default system in you and me is always to complain. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, you know, if you don't make the effort in the morning, you will be moaning and complaining. Well, 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 well. Oh, you know, it was a terrible day. I can't believe it. This went wrong. That went wrong. Blah, blah. And I, what I'm trying to say is that if you just be yourself, you don't pray, you don't seek the face of God, that's what you're going to be. But you know what you do to God? <coughs> you push Him away. Because you're not being what you're meant to be, which is thankful. Lord. Thank you for another day. Thank you for health and strength. Thank you for giving me a job. And if you haven't got a job, just thank him anyway. Thank him when you have a job. Thank him whenever you don't have a job. Thank him when you feel like it. Thank him whenever you don't feel it. The devil cannot deal with that. Amen. But if he knows that when circumstances are up, you're up. When circumstances are down, you're down. He will have a field day with you. This is what your Christian life will be. <coughs> down. Up. Down. Because you're governed by circumstances and not who he is. Your every day should be governed by who your God is. Amen. That's, what the, the, that's what the psalmist said. If I can get to it again. For the, I'll read that, that, the, them two verses again. Enter into his <coughs> gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. This psalmist had a revelation of his God. He wasn't governed by circumstances. He was governed by the fact that his God was who he says he was. That's all it takes. That's all it takes, friend. That your God is who he says he is. That should keep you thankful today, tomorrow, the next day. Every day should be thanksgiving for the believer. Just because you don't have a big turkey in front of you doesn't mean you don't give thanks. If it takes a big turkey to make you thankful, then you just better look in the mirror. Huh? You say, well, I didn't even have the money for a turkey at Thanksgiving. Well, do you know what? If you have food at all, just thank him. Amen. And if you have no food, still thank him. Amen. I mean, what I'm talking about here is just, how does the devil deal with somebody who's just determined to be thankful? It, it's impossible. The devil can't deal with that. It absolutely depresses him. <coughs> if you let your feelings, other circumstances govern your attitude, then you're going to be miserable, moody, and murmuring. At the moment, I'm in the book of Numbers, and <coughs> you, you know the story about God bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, opening the Red Sea. But I can tell you what, as you start to read that story and get into the book of Numbers, it starts to get very, very sad. Because a few months ago I preached about the victory. I preached on the subject of um, praising God on the wrong side of the river. You see, they didn't praise God in Egypt. They, they were murmuring in Egypt. So whenever they got to the other side, oh, hallelujah, God's so good, praise the Lord. Did you see what he did to them Egyptians? I mean, it's, 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 anybody can rejoice when they've just watched the Red Sea open and they've just seen God destroy his enemies. But it wasn't too long after that I mean, it's hard to believe it. It wasn't too long after that till they're murmuring again. This is the people of God. You'd have thought that they would have been the most thankful people on planet Earth. After all, look at what they've just witnessed. They have just witnessed an absolute supernatural deliverance. Would you agree? I mean, this is phenomenal. I mean, they say up to three million people... And they're standing on the, the edge of that water and they have to get across. 
suddenly the sea just opens. Three million believers. Can you imagine them looking at the big walls of water? Just standing like this. I mean, showing your little kids saying, Son, never forget this. This is who your God is. And just walking over that sea and go, and you lift them kids, look, this is who your God is. Your God is faithful. Your God is powerful. Your God is sovereign. He's in charge of the weather. He's in charge of the sea. Can you imagine the testimonies going over looking at that water? But then they get to the other side. And they're not long through the victory and over to the other side. And just look what happens in Numbers 14, verse 2. And it says, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation, the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would God we had died in the wilderness. Do you think that's thankfulness? Isn't that terrible? This is totally ungrateful. God is God deserved, didn't deserve this. And then in Numbers 14:10, all the congregation wanted to stone Aaron and Moses. Because they, they didn't want to go back to Egypt. They're saying we're going forward. And they want to stone them. The whole congregation. This is the whole congregation. They're missing it. Verse 11. Listen what God says. Because by the way, that's all that matters here. <coughs> and the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be? Ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them. It goes on to say in verse 26 of that chapter. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron saying, How long shall I bear this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmuring of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. See the word murmuring against Aaron and Moses, they were murmuring against God. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. God couldn't handle it anymore. All the complaining, all the murmur. And he said, look what I've done for you. And all you will do is murmur and complain. Verse 33. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years. And bear your whoredoms. Until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Do you know that from the Red Sea to the Promised Land was 400 miles? That should have taken them two weeks to walk. If they'd have just kept walking. Two weeks, and they were into the promised land. They were so close. They were so close. But yet they missed it. A couple of weeks ago when I, I was talking to the Morningside footballers, I, I talked on the subject of putting the ball in the net. And I finished with a question, and it was this. What happens if you nearly make heaven? What happens if you nearly make heaven? Can you understand what God, you, there's no prizes for nearly making it. There's no prizes for nearly winning yesterday. You either win or else you lose. And a lot of the time well, we, we think when God speaks, well, you know, it's optional. No, it's not optional. Obey or disobey. And as I was, I've, I've been reading this for a couple of weeks, but the, the subject really just started to develop. I'm saying that they were so close they nearly made the promised land, but they didn't make it. They should have been rejoicing. That 400 miles should have been just a Jericho march. Praise the Lord. Our God's good. Doesn't matter whether there's giants in the land. We're going to take the land. Praise the Lord. Two weeks. And then the, can you imagine the banners would have been waving as they, as they went over the River Jordan. They just went over the Red Sea. Now they're going into the River Jordan. Our God's a good God. Huh? You can imagine the flags and the kids would have been dancing. No, they're complaining and murmuring. And God says, you, there's no way. Forty years he let them go round and round the mountain. Round and round. Miserable. Just letting them die off. 
And I have seen so many Christians that have more ability to preach than I have, that have more giftings than I will ever have. And you know what? They're going around the mountain. They're going around the mountain. And I put it to you, the reason is, they don't have thankful hearts. They don't have thankful hearts. They are so full of themselves. And they'll complain about the slightest thing. But yet they've got the giftings and calls of God. And as a pastor in this church, I see that we have the, the potential to touch northeast Nebraska and Nebraska in this church. We have, there's no limit to where this here can go. But there, especially from youth camp, it has grieved me just the apathy and the, 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 the carnality of some Christians in this church. It's like we've experienced the victory and we just want to complain and we want to go the wrong way. Friends, we need to put the ball in the net. We have to go into the promised land. I don't want to be like the children of Israel. I don't want to wait to look. It's 40 years of age and the, or whatever. And the, he, he's going to be a preacher. Or some of these young men here are preachers because Kai and me feel God. Because we, we didn't enter in by faith. What I'm saying is we have to make it. There's going to be a cost for revival. But guess what? What's the alternative? Do you want to go around the mountain for 40 years? A lot of Christians are so dissatisfied. They don't bear any fruit. In this last 12 months, how many people have got saved through your life? How much fruit have you borne? How many people have found the Lord Jesus Christ because of who you are? You're just a thankful person. You're a pleasant person. When people are in need, they're knocking on your door. They're picking up the phone. Would you pray for me? Would you help me? Are you a thankful person? And you're attracting the blessing of God? Or are you complaining and, and God's going, I, I, can't even, I can't even go near that. And what I'm saying is we have to be thankful. Thanksgiving is focused on God. And it shows an attitude of appreciation and contentment. <coughs> Murmuring is focused on self. And shows an attitude of dissatisfaction and discontentment. Murmuring is self-centered. Thanksgiving is Christ-centered. There's a big, big difference on these two things. When someone is const constantly miserable, you know that they're captivated with themselves and self-interest. They're not a praising, thanking person. <clears throat> when you keep going despite the hardship, the loneliness, the opposition, you send a message out to everyone around you that your God's alive. When you thank the Lord despite all the trials, you are sending an incredible message out. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything, give thanks. I'll say that again. In everything, give thanks. When you're in the valley and it's hopeless and you still give thanks. Do you know what I loved about the Lord's table this morning? This guy come in with a heavy heart. This guy was struggling this morning when he came into church. But you see, God touched him this morning. And you say, well, why did he get up three or four times and give thanks at the Lord's table? He didn't give anyone else a chance. Let me tell you, thank God for that this morning. Amen. I wish everybody in this church would have been like Cameron Bowman this morning. Amen. He came in, he was struggling. I'm sitting there as a pastor. Sometimes you, as a pastor, you know the story, but others might. But what I'm saying is, I wish everybody was getting up three or four times. That, that, that I just couldn't end it. It's like, you know... The, Two getting up here, one getting up here. That's the way we should be when it comes to the Lord's table. That we should just be, if two people get up at the one time, keep thanking them. Do you think God can hear two prayers at the one time? Oh, yeah. Do you think he can hear four at the one time? Oh, yeah. What about a hundred? Yeah. Yeah. What about a hundred and twenty? Yeah. Huh? A thousand? Anyone any higher than a thousand? <laughs> a million? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> Google. What Google? Is, is, is that the? I don't know one with a thousand. Okay. <laughs> but can you understand? I'm just saying. You, you say, well, that's not dignified. Hello. Do you not think they're all speaking at the one time in heaven at the moment? Yes. It says they're all there before the throne, going worthy, worthy is allowed. Can you imagine what heaven's like? Oh, I can tell you. You don't need to whip anybody up to give thanks in heaven. 
Huh? They're looking at them nail prints in their hands and they're just, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. After a billion years, they're still thanking Him. Why do we have to wait till we get to heaven to be like that? Yeah. What I'm saying this morning is this. You and I, our attitude will determine what we achieve in life. The reason why many people are not, many Christians are not producing fruit is they're not thankful. They're not thankful. They blame everything else apart from themselves. Friend, if there's something holding you back this morning, it's you. Only you can hold you back. Nobody else, nothing else, no one can hold you back from thanking your God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. <coughs> you know, 